We're going to be discussing with Wayne Madsen uh, his background, not just with the NSA, but his expertise in naval warfare, particularly in tracking Russian and Chinese subs. That was his job as a naval officer before he worked in high-level security inside the National Security Agency. So he was actually one of the head directors of groups that did internal uh, investigations at the NSA. He's also written for the Village Voice, Counterpunch, uh, the Miami Herald, Houston Chronicle, Philadelphia Inquirer, amongst others. He's also a best-selling uh, author, and he's reported on hundreds of national security stories uh, at Congress and at the National Press Club. Frequent guest here, WayneMadsonReport.com. And he now is an official correspondent. As we've been telling you, you see his articles almost daily, five, six days a week at InfoWars.com. And uh, he's going to be on little secret missions. A lot of times you'll hear about where he's gone after he's been there, outside the U.S., inside the U.S. He's going to be covering uh, the RNC, the DNC. So we're getting that lined up to get him his credentials uh, this year. Uh, I have also, of course, will be traveling to those and covering them as well, as well as some of our other reporters. So uh, Wayne Madsen now here, part of the InfoWars operation. The first story he wanted to go on the ground uh, with was one he's already gone out a few years ago and investigated the very mysterious death of a CIA contractor pilot who was admittedly worked with the CIA, who was writing a book about 9-11 being an inside job, and then uh, he supposedly killed himself after he killed his family. He went and talked to neighbors and more, and they said it was very suspicious. He's going to recap all that, but his investigation of the person that was executed tied to the famous aircraft, both public and private, you know, governmental and private aviation uh, base that also runs some, some strange uh, clandestine connected airlines out of it today. So Wayne went back out there with one of our camera people uh, and investigated, I guess, for four days. So now they've returned. Uh, next week, we'll have the full report from on the ground. But obviously, this stuff's so dangerous, we want to go ahead and get the intel out now uh, for that report next week. Uh, Wayne Madsen joining us via Skype. I, I think it's important you recap from your research what you believe happened on 9-11. We know, obviously, the official story isn't true. We're not saying the whole government was involved. It was multinationals and operatives, obviously, inside. The stewardesses reported on air phones and real calls, gas, smoke, they couldn't breathe. Uh, clearly, these planes were fitted with remote control systems. We know that. Um, so, so there's a lot of pieces here. And then I want to get into the background on this and your findings. Uh, these are pretty bombshell. This is part one of several articles you're going to be writing up on Infowars.com. 9-11 CIA likely built remote control commercial jets in aircraft boneyard. This would explain how 9-11 hijackers were able to fly commercial jets with little experience. Uh, that report is up on Infowars.com. Wayne Madsen. Yes, Alex. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for providing the logistics support to kind of track down what Phil Marshall was after. In 2012, Phil Marshall, the late uh, Eastern and United pilot who had 15,000 hours in the cockpits uh, flying uh, for United, uh, specifically the Boeing 757 and 767, the two aircraft allegedly were told were involved in the 9-11 attack. Uh, Phil Marshall had been to the Pinal Air Park, which is right between uh, Phoenix and Tucson, but closer actually to Tucson. Uh, it's the old boneyard. Uh, it's been around for decades, probably I would say six decades or so. Uh, it was an Army airfield uh, uh, training base in World War II, and then it was leased back by the uh, Pinal County back to the CIA, who has been there with all kinds of different front companies, um, one of the biggest ones being Evergreen uh, Aviation. And it was when Evergreen had that particular uh, airfield that Phil Marshall went from California down there based on a tip he received from some old friends when he it used to fly for one uh, 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 Barry Seal, the uh, the DEA informant that was assassinated, gangland execution style in Baton Rouge in 1986. The, these old colleagues tipped them off and said, "Phil, you, you know, we know you're writing yet a third book on 9/11. You know, your answers are down here at the Pinal Air Park." So he went down there. The situation at the time was that air 
airfield was still controlled by Evergreen. There was still guards at the main gate, armed guards at the main gate. But uh, earlier this year, um, the uh, final sale of, uh, uh, of the airfield was made from Evergreen to a company called Marana Aerospace Solutions. And Marana Aerospace Solutions is actually owned by a, another company called Relativity LLC on North Fort Myer Drive in Roslyn in Arlington, Virginia. Now we have one individual who is a principal of Relativity, which is really the owner of Marana Aerospace Solutions, one Leslie Armitage, who also happens to be a co-founder of the Carlisle Group Europe, okay? So we have the Bush family involved with the Carlisle Group. The Bin Laden family were investors in the Carlisle Group. Uh, Frank Carlucci, the former uh, uh, CIA guy, uh, uh, is the chairman emeritus of the Carlisle Group. And uh, so it was really uh, incumbent to get down to this uh, facility since for about, I'd say, nine months, uh, the security uh, has been dropped at the main gate, which allowed us, myself and the InfoWars cameraman, to proceed onto the base. And we were actually also able to get a tour uh, in the restricted area by one of the county officials responsible for this facility, which was kind of, uh, uh, we really lucked out on that one because- This is unprecedented. For those that don't know, this has been very restricted for a long time. So you use this open window to get in and of course the, the investigative journalist that died had been connected into the government as well we'll talk about some of his past and why they were so scared of him folks this is very dangerous and of course wayne won't say that himself but uh, i'm gonna get him to talk about it this this is not a safe report for us to be doing uh, for us to be engaged in and i'm not bragging i'm just saying that this is not a game just understand this is very important stay with us wayne madsen investigative journalist with Infowars.com, joins us. He has just returned from spending um, four days out in Arizona at the famous, highly secretive boneyard that is admittedly run by the CIA. Now it's been handed over to the Carlisle Group, who is at the very top of the pyramid when it comes to the military-industrial complex that Eisenhower warned us of. And the connections of the Carlisle Group to 9-11 are staggering. They were even in the London Guardian and Associated Press that the Bushes were at the main table, former President Bush, with the head of the Bin Laden family when 9-11 happened in Langley, Virginia. Now, Carlisle Group subcompany runs the boneyard that the investigative journalist was investigating when he was killed. So, Wayne, this is a six-minute segment, long segment coming up. Then we'll shift gears with your naval background into the Russian sub, supposedly on the East Coast cable, uh, underwater cable, uh, the situation with the Spratly Islands and the Chinese. I mean, with your NSA and naval background in naval warfare and anti-submarine uh, warfare activity, you're, you're perfect to be able to speak to this. But let's continue now getting back into why this is such a big deal, what your findings are, the report coming up next week, but to have the Carlisle Group in the middle of this and using a front company, this just sends up more alarm bells. Well, right, and Phil Phil Marshall, the late Phil Marshall, who, who according to the Calaveras County, uh, California Sheriff, is said to have on sometime around the evening of January 31st, uh, 2013, he's said to have taken uh, his uh, uh, Glock, uh, killed, uh, his uh, teenage son, his teenage daughter, the family dog, and then turned the weapon on himself. Uh, he was writing a third book about 9-11, and he apparently was tipped off about something having to do with Pinal Air Park. Now, this came to me by a relative of his at his funeral, which I attended in Mandeville, Louisiana, and also from an FBI agent. So, uh, <laughs> you know, you can't go wrong with those kinds of uh, tips. Uh, the issue was that up until early this year, as I said, you couldn't even get anywhere near this facility. You could see it from the fence line, but that's as far as you would be able to go. You couldn't get through the gate, so we were able to do that. Um, now, uh, Phil Marshall, the hard disk that uh, had his manuscript on it for his third book has disappeared. Last we knew, it was in the uh, hands of the Department of Justice in, in Sacramento in the, in, the, in the crime lab. Nobody knows what's happened to it. 
But it's quite clear whatever Marshall got was along the lines of what we picked up in, in Pinal uh, this past week, because it's very, very clear that Pinal not only takes planes in for storage, it takes planes in for quick maintenance, it takes planes in to be have their parts cannibalized, and then uh, they're sent to scrap. They take planes in, put in storage, and they're put back in maintenance and returned to full service. Yet uh, another uh, feature of this particular facility is that they can fabricate parts for airplanes there, brand new parts. And I ask the question, as everybody may be aware of what a drop gun is, you take parts of different parts from a gun, you put a new gun together and it's untraceable. Well, I, no pun intended, but the same thing can be done with aircraft at Pinal Air Park, so we could maybe call them drop planes. Being and in operation, so no start over with your drop planes point because that's important after the break, but I just want to add the bombshell. For those that don't know, Operation Northwoods, uh, Kennedy said no to the plan. Eisenhower said no to the plan right before he left office as well. That's why he gave the famous speech warning of a military takeover with corporate interest that they would create fake aircraft built basically out of parts, put a tail number on it, launch CIA people under fake names to have that plane land safely or blow that plane up and then have the other plane go to another location to make it look like uh, the Soviets had actually blown up a plane uh, on behalf of the Cubans. They were also going to bomb sports stadiums, malls, uh, shoot up military bases to blame the Soviets and basically start World War III. That's even ABC News. So we're going to break. But when you talk about a drop plane, we know that they had aircrafts, uh, another Flight 93 that landed at an air base, at a NASA base. Uh, we know a whole bunch of weirdness went on, and the official story of 9-11 is fake. And we know there was all sorts of weird stuff on the bottoms of two of the planes. They didn't fit uh, as passenger liners. So we're trying to cobble together exactly what happened, and it ties back to the CIA-run base. We just sent reporters there. Wayne Madsen is our guest, and we're just doing a data dump here live on air before the special report comes out last week because it's dangerous to sit on information like we're sitting on. I have interviewed two guests that Wayne Madsen helped me get on that ended up dying. One of them, of course, the D.C. Madam. And I mean months after she was on. I have interviewed people involved in 9-11 like Barry Jennings, and he's dead two weeks after he's on, deputy head of emergency management, detailing bombs in Building 7. I'm not trying to get killed. I've got a duty to fight these people. Our country's been hijacked by criminals. Our government, as you know, on the one-year anniversary of Obama saying there's a red line in Syria, if Assad uses chemical weapons, we will invade you. On the one-year anniversary of that, when they had the U.S. forces ready to invade in the air bombardment, Al-Qaeda launched two different chemical attacks. It later even came out at the U.N. and mainstream news that, indeed, Al-Qaeda launched the attacks. Because Al-Qaeda isn't completely controlled by the West, it's a wind-up toy. And they shot videos to be rock stars. That's what they do. College, you know, people want to get touchdowns to get girls. Al-Qaeda chops Christians' heads off, rapes women, and blows up churches and launches chemical attacks. And, of course, it came out it was Saudi Arabian uh, nerve gas. It was identified. Now they flooded Europe with all these jihadis. We don't know exactly what happened on 9-11, but we know that it's not the official story we've been told and we've seen. So, Wayne, I want you to get into what you, from your research, really believe happened on 9-11, but also, as you said, the data dump on this. But I interrupted you with the break coming up when you were making the point that this is a drop plane. Well, we know in Operation Northwoods they talk about having two aircraft, one that they fly up, that they blow up, the other that they actually take off with CIA personnel on board with John Doe, Jane Doe names to have those people's names in the news. The FBI, to its credit, as you know, came out two years after 9-11 and said, we went and looked at these so-called calls. None of them were real. The, um, the Solicitor General's wife did not call him, as he said, on CNN. The only two calls were air phone calls 
back in the day when you had the paid air phones and the stewardesses did make calls saying we can't breathe, there's gas, there's smoke. Two different planes. We have the audio of that. We have NORAD with the drills. We have the stand down. I mean, the problem with 9-11 is when I start talking about it, I could talk for 10 hours. There's so much evidence that the official story is not true. As best you can tell, as a deep researcher, guy that's written books on this, what happened on 9-11, the 28 pages have come out now. If our government would launch chemical attacks with Al-Qaeda to frame somebody that killed thousands, they would do this. What happened on 9-11, and then how does it tie to this airfield? And, and you did a whole investigation on clearly this guy was executed who was about to expose what went on there. What do you think he discovered? Because I want to get it all out there so they don't come, obviously, kill you. Well, I believe that Phil Marshall discovered that uh, he, he just couldn't, with all his experience flying 757s and 767s, he could not believe that, a, that some trainees with a rudimentary uh, training in, in uh, simulators and whatnot could have pulled this off. Even he said actual pil experienced pilots would not have been able to fly those planes like that, which I think wh what that leaves us with in his interest in the Pinal Air Park was that these planes that were uh, sent into the buildings on 9-11 uh, must have had remote control uh, technology introduced, possibly at Pinal, although we don't know that. But what we do know is that Evergreen, the, the CIA contractor that had that facility at the time of 9-11, specialized, uh, specializes in, in remote control aircraft. Um, they're involved in a lot of things, from selling Christmas trees and running vineyards to um, uh, performing weather modification with a fleet of aircraft. So they're, they're a diversified country. But back on 9-11, one of the things I got from the people there at Pinal, they've got about 100 planes there now in various states of repair. Some are going to go back to service. Some will go to scrap. Others will be stored there. But in the months before and right after 9-11, Pinal never had as many planes on that airfield as they did then. They had in the neighborhood of over 200 aircraft as exposed as as, um, as um, compared to uh, about 100 today. So uh, we do know that the, not only could they fabricate parts, they could repaint aircraft out there. You know, you might get a Turkmenistan Airlines in uh, there one day. It gets maintained. Uh, gets brought up, and then it goes back out as Suriname Airways. That's what one of the functions of this base. Uh, it's been uh, around for decades, as I said. It used to be the home port of Air America, Southern Air Transport, uh, Air Asia, uh, Civil Air Transport. You name, you name the CIA proprietary, Intermountain Aviation. Intermountain is who uh, uh, um, uh, Phil Marshall flew uh, for back in the 80s when he flew Barry Seal in and out of MENA down to Central America. So... He was familiar with the companies that have been down there, but I, I think we have to look at remote control uh, airplanes as, uh, as now uh, a distinct possibility to explain why they killed Marshall. He was sitting on this information, but it, as I say, it disappeared with his hard drive uh, after he was killed along with his family. For you, what are the biggest smoking guns of 9-11? I mean, there are so many, Wayne. Well, I, I believe it was the uh, our version of the Reichstag fire in Germany uh, that, uh, of course, Hitler used that as an excuse to tear up the uh, the German Constitution, the Weimar Republic Constitution, with his enabling act. 9/11 uh, uh, facilitated the Patriot Act and all of its uh, various offspring. And uh, it, it uh, I remember that the neocon phrase back then, the new normal. I thought that was a terrible. Uh, phrase, I, I called it uh, the imposition of fascism in the United States. And I think that's what 9-11 was intended to do, change this country for for all intents and purposes from a constitutional republic into a uh, corporate oligarchical uh, um, uh, dictatorship. And again, every time I start talking about 9-11, I made four films on the subject, wrote a book on the subject, have interviewed probably more people than anybody else on the subject. I'm not bragging, but I am the first guy to officially say it was coming two months before it happened. I said they're going to blow up the World Trade Centers, blame it on their asset, Bin Laden. It's all on record. Uh, I've interviewed the firefighters that were told there were bombs in the buildings, the police officers. 
uh, it's just sickening how much evidence there is. But six of the 10 commissioners have said there was a cover up and that was used to take our freedoms and should be investigated as a conspiracy, including the chairman of the committee, Senator Bob Graham, as you know. And then, Wayne, if you expand on that, the biggest thing is, is the document from April of the year before, Rebuilding America's Defenses, PNAC, Project for New American Century, with the main author, Dick Cheney and Jeb Bush, along with Wolfowitz uh, and two others, writing this 40-page this document, 41-page document, where it says we need a catalyzing new Pearl Harbor event to create this global government run by America and to get rid of the liberties. And then they have the Hart Rubin Commission at the CFR three days after say we need to use this disaster to bring in a new world order. So they think we're so stupid, they admitted so much of it. And then you want to think, well, they just let the people attack them. But then you find out 15 of the hijackers were from Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is in the 28 pages quarterbacking. Then, then they order a, a stand down. And it, it's clear they were just patsies in drills, as the head of the Defense Language School, Stephen Butler, Colonel Butler, said. And they put them on board the planes. I think the evidence is pretty conclusive. Gassed everyone. We don't know if it was nerve gas or just sleeping gas. Probably nerve gas. And then flew these planes into the buildings uh, with remote control. I mean, it's really pretty simple. And then you had all the convenient passports, two of them being found that day out of the rubble. Impossible. Uh, the bag of Ada gets caught in the machine with all the admissions. The car gets found with all of it. I mean, this is so phony. John O'Neill, the deputy head of the FBI, gives a speech a month before, says the government's going to let bin Laden attack to take our liberties in England. He comes back. He quits. Then they hire him as the head of security at the World Trade Center. His first day at work's 9-11, and he dies in the attack. And it goes on for hours, Wayne, for hours. It's And then Building 7. They blow it up. They say it's fallen. It hasn't fallen. Then it falls in its own footprint. Then BBC says they didn't say that. Then they say, okay, we did say that. Reuters told us. Then we find CNN says the same thing. I mean, they jumped the gun. Like saying Lee Harvey Oswald shot Kennedy an hour before his name was released. It was already in the foreign newspapers because they got the time zones wrong. I mean, it's just ridiculous, Wayne, uh, how, how over the top of this. And the, and the other thing is, remember, there's been a lot of discrepancies about some some uh, some people say there is a Boeing 737 engine found uh, in New York. Well, if you ha if these drop planes were constructed of Pinal and uh, used in 9/11, that would certainly explain uh, the various other parts that obviously were not from a 757 or a 767 being found in various crash locations, and also. If you if you uh, file off the serial numbers as you do as as done with drop guns, uh, you really can't uh, trace these airplanes back to any uh, point of origin. So uh, that is obviously what the, sure. the importance of Pinal is. The other thing we discovered outside the main gate of Pinal, there's a huge pile of soil there. It's been there a while. It, it's it almost looks like a natural formation, but it's not. And the word we got is that's the soil left over from the uh, tunnel excavations done by the CIA uh, at some point in time when they had that base. So there's obviously, it's a, it's an iceberg situation out there. What you see on the ground is no indication of what lies underneath that facility. Well, it's sensationally dangerous. And obviously, if they're going to retrofit and create drop planes or planes that look like passenger jets that aren't, because here I am saying there were real passenger planes and they nerve gassed the folks, but there's some evidence that those were diverted and landed. And some people were, again, landed and then people were taken off. That was in the news. Bottom line, we don't know exactly what happened, but there's a lot of evidence pointing towards this base and it needs to be investigated. Is that what you're basically getting at? Absolutely. I think to the one thing that needs to be reinvestigated is the uh, California investigation of Phil Marshall and his family's death. They ruled that a murder-suicide, uh, at the very least, what they need to do, and it should come from the California Attorney General, uh, they need to reinvestigate that as a triple homicide. Now, I'm just going from memory from your investigation two years ago and joining us in the articles you wrote, but wasn't he again connected into some clandestine operations as well? He had flown uh, for the CIA as a contract pilot back in the early 80s. He was uh, flying Barry Seal around, you know, the 
the CIA agent sure. turned DEA informant who was who was uh, uh, executed right before he was going to testify in federal court. And when he was arrested, found in his briefcase was the personal phone number of then Vice President George H. W. Bush. So here we have the Bush with Canal, Carlisle Group. The the Bush family is the common and common denominator. You can start with the Kennedy assassination, where you had uh, Poppy Bush standing there in front of the school book depository, all the way up to Jeb Bush today, not wanting to talk about 9-11, saying what a great job his brother did in protecting us. Well, tell that to the people who died on 9-11, what a great job he did. And, you know, he gets he gets to be like a child every time Trump hits him with the 9-11 business. Wayne Madsen. Any other points you want to make on this subject before we shift gears into the submarine cable situation and then the situation with the Chinese openly threatening war with the Spratly Islands? Is your naval background in submarines, in submarine warfare, in tracking submarines, uh, your background in the Spratly Islands? I know you're an expert in this area. I would just say on the, on the Marshall case, as I'm starting to get now information from people who are familiar with the uh, what was going on there uh, in Pinal with Evergreen? So yeah, I'm 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 getting more information. So uh, we'll just see what what comes uh, comes our way now. Um, okay, who's in the wrong with the China situation? You know, I just go where the facts seem to be. It seems like China is expanding their territorial waters. They're grabbing things that have been in dispute. They're building bases. They're saying, you know, get out of here or we'll come after you to the United States. Uh, I, I don't want to sit there and say the United States is is completely on the right, um, but it does seem like China is becoming more and more aggressive. Uh, what is your view on that? Well, the United States has tried to claim some area of influence over the, uh, these Paracel and Spratly Islands ever since the Vietnam War. In those days, the government of South Vietnam had military garrisons on some of these same islands, and then the U.S. would go in and protect the South Vietnamese garrisons against uh, uh, claims from North Vietnam. Now we're on the side of Vietnam against China. Uh, the the area is known as the South China Sea, and China is going to protect that uh, that area just like the United States. You know, the Gulf of Mexico is international. Uh, the Caribbean is international. But try to be another country. Uh, from out of the area and send your naval fleets in there and see what happens. Uh, we don't like it. And uh, the U.S. has, um, has uh, disputed uh, claims on islands in the Pacific and in the Caribbean. Uh, I'm sure we wouldn't uh, like it if, uh, say, China were to send uh, some naval ships off of Navassa Island, which we occupy, but which the Republic of Haiti claims in the Caribbean, and says, hey, uh, we're going we're gonna to steam our Chinese vessels uh, very close to Nav Navassa Island, and uh, and and you know if you don't like it, tough, you know uh, that's that's just tough. And uh, the same thing in the in the Pacific with some islands uh, that are claiming U.S. held islands they say are their own. So uh, you know there is a uh, inter international maritime organization, but the U.S. wants to settle this not through negotiations or diplomacy by but by sending uh, naval task forces into the area. I think uh, that just shows that we are uh, trying to intimidate the Chinese, and uh, that's not a good idea in their home waters. They uh, they have a building, uh, a growing navy, and uh, I think they're not building that navy just to sit there uh, and um, uh, have it on show. I think they'll intend to use it if they feel like they're up against the wall. Well, they've got top Navy admirals saying this could turn into a war. I know both sides claim they have interest. A lot of this, though, isn't it about growing tension between Vietnam and China? We've had Chinese military take over oil rigs. We've had the border with Vietnam and China have some skirmishes. Um, is this really about oil and gas being discovered in that area? Oh, not only that. Sure it is. Uh, there's, uh, there are uh, natural gas, oil in the area. It's also about the, uh, the TTP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which Vietnam is a member of, but the U.S. froze China out of that process. So what we see being built up is sort of like a uh, version of NATO in uh, in Southeast and East Asia, where the U.S. will have its own club uh, and China uh, will not be a member of it, uh, just like we see sure. Europe and the Middle East, uh, Middle East with NATO and Russia's on the outside looking Well, sure, in. and now they've green-lighted Japan arming at a feverish rate. We know Japan has a big secret military. Now that's going public. We're going to come back, take some phone calls.
uh, on the election, on the debate last night, and more. Welcome back. I'm going to do this segment and one more, and then Anthony Gucciardi takes over. You know, this report is so big on 9-11 and, and, and other things that are happening. I'm tempted to fly Wayne Madsen here next week, next Wednesday, if he can do it, to be in studio with us and also plan out some of the other investigative reports he wants to go out and uh, engage in. So we'll see if that can happen. And, and again, I've gotten better about not talking over host or, or, or guest. I've gotten a lot better. Everybody's noticed. The problem is you talk about 9-11 with me or carbon taxes or Agenda 21 or whatever the stuff I'm really informed on, I get a headache. I want to just tell everybody thousands of points. I'm talking thousands of points. 9-11 is such a ridiculous fraud that it's insane. It's like finding 20 dead bodies in the back of somebody's pickup truck, and you don't know exactly where the guy driving it got it. He won't tell you what he did, but you go to his house, and there's all these chainsaws and blood and bodies, and then videos of him with the dead bodies, and you're like, buddy, we know you're involved. We don't know exactly how you did it or where you got all these people, but you are the suspect, and we can tell you did it. <laughs> <laughs> and then you got the motive to take our freedoms. It makes me sick. Now, I, I want to shift gears, take a few calls for Wayne Madsen from Eric, Damian, John, Chad, Nick, and others. I appreciate folks holding. But Wayne, separately with this heat up of war with Russia, obviously Russia's got its own problems. We're not saying it's perfect, but the West is starting war with them. I remember being a kid hearing about Russian subs on U.S. cables in the Atlantic, you know, when I was watching CBS News with Dan Rather while my mom cooked dinner in the kitchen. Do you think the Russians really are putting submersible vehicles down on the cables? That They don't say they cut them, or is this just hype? What do you think is going on? A submarine that does the same type of thing. It's the USS Jimmy Carter, specially configured submarine for those same kinds of operations. So obviously the, the Russians are conducting drills like we conduct drills. Uh, the Israelis have submarines that have done the same thing. And a few years ago, if you recall, there was... There were massive submarine cable cuts in the eastern Mediterranean that were uh, reportedly uh, uh, done by the Israeli submarines uh, because they that basically cut off all uh, the, the communications to Iran, Pakistan, all the way to Southeast Asia. So th these are the types of things that are done. Uh, when I worked in the Navy, we had something called the Sound Surveillance System, SOSIS, and after a few disclosures, thanks to uh, the spy John Walker and the capture by North Korea, the Pueblo, the Russians would routinely send their submarines around our hydrophone arrays to let us know that they knew what we had there. And then, you know, they'd rev up their, their engines and, <laughs> uh, you know, cause all kinds of uh, uh, acoustic anomalies for the uh, ocean systems technicians that were listening. So that's uh, the equivalent of a teenager burning out his uh, tires from the hamburger place. Yeah, pretty much. This is, these are... Uh, the, the, the Russians are letting us know uh, that they know. Look, everybody knows where these cables are anyway. There's maps of them, and and uh, and, and some of the uh, Ed Snowden documents released. Obviously, the NSA knows exactly where all the submarines and has are. their own taps on them. They're tapping them exactly right. Well, that's what's crazy is they take normal military drills by other countries and act like it's acts of war, while the West are the ones moving weaponry up against uh, other countries' borders. Right. We're right, right now, we're, we're supposedly supporting the Syrian Kurds against uh, their enemies, and, and the Turks uh, are now said to be bombing the same people, Turkey, our NATO ally. Uh, what kind of policy is this? Either we support uh, the Kurds, uh, the Russians are supporting the Syrian Kurds, but we're going to allow the Turks to, to bomb them? It's, it's total schizophrenia. Stay there. We're back in a minute and a half. We're going to take a few calls and let you get out of here. Wayne Matson report.com. Briefly, before I end this hour and come back in the fourth hour that a lot of stations are starting to pick up now that we've added it. We've got a lot of specials running now that end on the 31st or on the 1st. Free shipping, 10% off, storable foods, InfoWarsStore.com, InfoWarsSelect.com. Free shipping, 10% off on water filtration systems like the new Alexa Pure Pro. And we've got 25% off the liver cleanse, gallbladder cleanse, oxy powder package at InfoWarsLife.com. And your purchase makes it all possible, so thank you. We'll be back. A globalist surveillance blimp crashed. Joe Biggs has got a report coming up. Anthony Gucciardi will have highlights of the debate. 
the skewed questions. It was pretty sick. Wayne, I want to take a few calls on that subject. And anybody else we don't get to will have to hold, and they'll get to them uh, throughout the hour. We appreciate the callers. But what did you think of the debate? I don't know if you watched it. We don't script these interviews uh, last night. I mean, the, the questions were some of the most attack dog I've ever seen, and it really blew up in the media's face. Well, I, I just wish they would go back to the original debate formats of years past where uh, you, you actually had a, a debate rather than a joint news conference. League of Women Voters did a good job. They sure did, going back to the Kennedy-Nixon debate of 1960. Uh, they were only thrown out of the process after uh, the RNC and the DNC got together uh, and created like this uh, presidential debate commission, which is a monopoly, well, a duopoly of power. That's why you don't get a uh, Ralph Nader's or they, I mean, Ross Perot had to fight tooth and nail to get into the one in 92. And that wouldn't have happened unless his, his poll numbers were so high at the time. So uh, it would be nice to see uh, the League of Women Voters and then see the League, if they were in charge, they could say, look, if you don't have a certain threshold, you know, you're not going to be Bobby Jindal. You're not going to have the kiddie table debate or the undercard debate. You're only going to have debates b between uh, those who are. Uh, a command, and not from these phony polls either. You see, the media runs their own polls, so they can determine who they're going to put on the, you know. Sure. The from state. the wide spectrum, who do you think is still in the lead, Republican-wise? You think it's, uh, you think it's uh, Trump, and on the Democratic side, is it Clinton or is it uh, Sanders? Oh, I think it's uh, clearly Hillary Clinton on the Democratic side, and uh, I think it's still Trump uh, on the Republican side. I mean, uh, Ben Carson did not really do himself any favors. Uh, when he, uh, you know, he, he, he's flip-flopping on a lot of issues now. Uh, and I think uh, Jeb Bush is the big surprise. Everybody thought it was going to be Bush v. Clinton again in 2016. Uh, his temper tantrums, like the little spoiled Bush he is, uh, are not doing him any favors. So his, his decrease in popularity uh, has uh, caused Marco Rubio to basically uh, pick up some of his strength. Sure. And, of course, that's why... Uh, Bush launched into a, the, the attack on his old uh, uh, mentor, uh, or his, I should Minion. say his apprentice, uh, 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 Rubio, uh, for, for uh, high absenteeism in the Senate. Let's jam in some calls here, and we'll get to everybody, but I'm leaving because Gucci already's taking over. Got a nice, fresh horse ready to, ready to lead the charge here coming up. Uh, let's go ahead and go to John in FEMA Region 5, then Eric. Uh, go ahead, sir. Thanks for holding. Yeah, Alex, how you been? Good, brother. Hey, I hope you enjoyed your time off. You could probably use some more. Uh, I loved it, yeah. I, uh, my cable system here where I lived in does not even have CNBC on it, so I had to go to the source and watch it on um, InfoWars last night. And uh, some of the questions were just, I mean, it was just totally ridiculous. Um the way they were asking the questions, the questions, and they were going back to the same people to avoid going to the front runners, basically. And it was, I did it, notice it, they were trying to give more time to folks that weren't front runners this time. And in the past, it was supposedly whoever was the front runner got more time. I, I would just rather have equal time, but it's kind of hard to control. And yes, we do live coverage of these debates with our reporters there in live time analyzing the propaganda via fair use. Um, what's your take on that, Wayne Madsen, uh, on why they were giving some people more time? Well, because I, I think the media clearly shows favorites in all these debates. Uh, that's why the, 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 there should be an, uh, a, a neutral uh, group that handles the debate, the questions. Uh, in other words, you could have, you could have a, a member of the media asking the questions, but the questions should be uh, developed by some neutral uh, like the League of Women Voters. I mean, the League of Women Voters came up with the questions in 1960, and Howard K. Smith posed the questions to uh, Kennedy and Nixon. So that's what we need to go back to. But you got the, them to like, look, th this is a, the reason why Trump is doing as well as he is. Uh, the, the media has turned this entire process into a re reality TV show, and he's the king of reality. That's TV. right. Great job, Wayne. We'll talk to you soon. Anthony Gucciardi coming up.
And it's that type of behavior that spurred me to do the research to develop a true nutraceutical formula that was designed to smooth out and help children focus. All of our children are hit with modern mind control. Television, music, fast food, GMOs, sugars, you name it. Young humans have not yet developed their nervous system and are being hammered daily by globalist concoctions. It's no wonder they can't focus and calm down and then are put on dangerous psychotropic drugs. Working with my team, we set out to find the best formula with the highest quality ingredients that children would actually like and take. We worked with the leading manufacturer in nutritional supplements that are safe for children to bring you the most affordable and powerful calming formula out there. Introducing Child Ease with herbs and calming extracts like chamomile and lemon balm and essential nutrients that taste great. Obtain your Child Ease today at InfoWarsLife.com. That's Child Ease exclusively at InfoWarsLife.com. So, so there's a lot of pieces here. And then I want to get into the background on this and your findings. Uh, these are pretty bombshell. This is part one of several articles you're going to be writing up on Infowars.com. 9-11 CIA likely built remote control commercial jets in aircraft boneyard. This would explain how 9-11 hijackers were able to fly commercial jets with little experience. Uh, that report is up on Infowars.com. Wayne Madsen. Yes, Alex. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for providing the logistics support to kind of track down what Phil Marshall was after. In 2012, Phil Marshall, the late uh, Eastern and United pilot who had 15,000 hours in the cockpits uh, flying uh, for United, uh, specifically the Boeing 757 and 767, the two aircraft allegedly were told were involved in the 9-11 attack. Uh, Phil Marshall had been the Pinal Air Park, which is right between uh, Phoenix and Tucson, but closer actually to Tucson. Uh, it's the old boneyard. Uh, it's been around for decades, probably, I would say, six decades or so. Uh, it was an Army airfield uh, uh, training base in World War II, and then it was leased back by the uh, Pinal County back to the CIA, who has been there with all kinds of different front companies. Um, one of the biggest ones being Evergreen uh, Aviation. And it was when Evergreen had that particular uh, airfield that Phil Marshall went from California down there based on a tip he received from some old friends when he used to fly for one, uh, 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 Barry Seal, the, uh, the DEA informant that was assassinated gangland execution style in Baton Rouge in 1986. The, these old colleagues, tipped them off and said, Phil, you, you know, we know you're writing yet a third book on 9-11. You know, your answers are down here at the Pinal Air Park. So he went down there. The situation at the time was that air airfield was still controlled by Evergreen. There was still guards at the main gate, armed guards at the main gate. But uh, earlier this year, um, the uh, final sale of, uh, uh, of the airfield was made from Evergreen to a company called Marana Aerospace Solutions. And Marana Aerospace Solutions is actually owned by a, another company called Relativity LLC on North Fort Myer Drive in Roslyn in Arlington, Virginia. Now we have one individual who is a principal of Relativity, which is really the owner of Marana Aerospace Solutions, one Leslie Armitage, who also happens to be a co-founder of the Carlisle Group Europe. Okay, so we have the Bush family involved with the Carlisle Group. We're going to be discussing with Wayne Madsen uh, his background, not just with the NSA, but his expertise in naval warfare particularly in tracking Russian and Chinese subs. That was his job as a naval officer before he worked in high-level security inside the National Security Agency. So he was actually one of the head directors of groups that did internal uh, investigations at the NSA. He's also written for the Village Voice, Counterpunch, uh, the Miami Herald, Houston Chronicle, Philadelphia Inquirer, amongst others. He's also a best-selling uh, author. And he's reported on hundreds of national security stories uh, at Congress and at the National Press Club. Frequent guest here, WayneMadsonReport.com. And he now is an official correspondent. As we've been telling you, you see his articles almost daily 
five, six days a week at InfoWars.com. And uh, he's going to be on little secret missions. A lot of times you'll hear about where he's gone after he's been there. Outside the U.S., inside the U.S., he's going to be covering uh, the RNC, the DNC. So we're getting that lined up to get him his credentials uh, this year. Uh, I have also, of course, will be traveling to those and covering them as well, as well as some of our other reporters. So uh, Wayne Madsen now here, part of the InfoWars operation. The first story he wanted to go on the ground uh, with was one he's already gone out a few years ago and investigated the very mysterious death of a CIA contractor pilot who was admittedly worked with the CIA, who was writing a book about 9-11 being an inside job, and then he supposedly killed himself after he killed his family. He went and talked to neighbors and more, and they said it was very suspicious. He's going to recap all that, but his investigation of the person that was executed tied to the famous aircraft, both public and private, you know, governmental and private aviation uh, base that also runs some, some strange uh, clandestine connected airlines out of it today. So Wayne went back out there with one of our camera people uh, and investigated, I guess, for four days. So now they've returned. Uh, next week, we'll have the full report from on the ground. But obviously, this stuff's so dangerous, we want to go ahead and get the intel out now uh, for that report next week. Uh, Wayne Madsen joining us via Skype. I, I think it's important you recap from your research what you believe happened on 9-11. We know, obviously, the official story isn't true. We're not saying the whole government was involved. It was multinationals and operatives, obviously, inside. The stewardesses reported on air phones and real calls, gas, smoke, they couldn't breathe. Uh, clearly, these planes were fitted with remote control systems. We know that. Um, 2013, he said to have taken uh, his uh, uh, Glock, uh, killed uh, his uh, teenage son, his teenage daughter, the family dog, and then turned the weapon on himself. Uh, he was writing a third book about 9-11. And he apparently was tipped off about something having to do with Pinal Air Park. Now, this came to me by a relative of his at his funeral, which I attended in Mandeville, Louisiana, and also from an FBI agent. So, uh, <laughs> you know, you can't go wrong with those kinds of uh, tips. Uh, the issue was that up until early this year, as I said, you couldn't even get anywhere near this facility. You could see it from the fence line, but that's as far as you would be able to go. You couldn't get through the gate, so we were able to do that. Um, now, uh, Phil Marshall, the hard disk that uh, had his manuscript on it for his third book has disappeared. Last we knew it was in the uh, hands of the Department of Justice in, in Sacramento in the, in, the, hmm. in the crime lab. Nobody knows what's happened to it, but it's quite clear whatever Marshall got was along the lines of what we picked up in, in Pinal uh, this past week, because it's very, very clear that Pinal not only takes planes in for storage, it takes planes in for quick maintenance, it takes planes in to be have their parts cannibalized, and then uh, they're sent to scrap. They take planes in, put in storage, and they're put back in maintenance and returned to full service. Yet uh, another uh, feature of this particular facility is that they can fabricate parts for airplanes there. Brand new parts. And I asked the question, as everybody may be aware of what a drop gun is. You take parts of different parts from a gun, you put a new gun together, and it's untraceable. Well, I, no pun intended, but the same thing can be done with aircraft at Pinal Air Park, so we could maybe call them drop planes. Being and in operation, so no start over with your drop planes point, because that's important after the break. But I just want to add the bombshell. For those that don't know, Operation Northwoods, uh, Kennedy said no to the plan. Eisenhower said no to the plan right before he left office as well. That's why he gave the famous speech warning of a military takeover with corporate interest that they would create fake aircraft built basically out of parts, put a tail number on it, launch CIA people under fake names to have that plane land safely or blow that plane up and then have the other plane go to another location to make it look like uh, the Soviets had actually blown up a plane uh, on behalf of the Cubans. They were also going to bomb sports stadiums, malls, uh, shoot up military bases to blame the Soviets and basically start World War III. That's even ABC News. So we're going to break. But when you talk about a drop plane, 
We know that they had aircrafts. Group. The Bin Laden family were investors in the Carlisle Group. Uh, Frank Carlucci, the former uh, uh, CIA guy, uh, uh, is the chairman emeritus of the Carlisle Group. And uh, so it was really uh, incumbent to get down to this uh, facility since for about, I'd say, nine months, uh, the security uh, has been dropped at the main gate, which allowed us myself and the InfoWars cameraman to proceed onto the base. And we were actually also able to get a tour uh, in the restricted area by one of the county officials responsible for this facility, which was kind of, uh, uh, we really lucked out on that one because- This is unprecedented. For those that don't know, this has been very restricted for a long time. So you use this open window to get in. And of course, the, the investigative journalist that died had been connected into the government as well. We'll talk about some of his past and why they were so scared of him. Folks, this is very dangerous. And of course, Wayne won't say that himself, but uh, I'm going to get him to talk about it. This, this is not a safe report for us, to be doing, uh, for us to be engaged in. And I'm not bragging. I'm just saying that this is not a game. Just understand this is very important. Stay with us. Wayne Madsen, investigative journalist with Infowars.com, joins us. He has just returned from spending um, four days out in... Arizona at the famous, highly secretive boneyard that is admittedly run by the CIA. Now it's been handed over to the Carlisle Group, who is at the very top of the pyramid when it comes to the military-industrial complex that Eisenhower warned us of. And the connections of the Carlisle Group to 9-11 are staggering. They were even in the London Guardian and Associated Press that the Bushes were at the main table, former President Bush, with the head of the Bin Laden family when 9-11 happened in Lanley, Virginia. Now, Carlisle Group sub-company runs the boneyard that the investigative journalist was investigating when he was killed. So, Wayne, this is a six-minute segment, long segment coming up. Then we'll shift gears with your naval background into the Russian sub, supposedly on the East Coast cable, uh, underwater cable, uh, the situation with the Spratly Islands and the Chinese. I mean, with your NSA and naval background in naval warfare and anti-submarine uh, warfare activity, you're, you're perfect to be able to speak to this. But let's continue now getting back into why this is such a big deal, what your findings are, the report coming up next week. But to have the Carlisle Group in the middle of this and using a front company, this just sends up more alarm bells. Well, right. And Phil, Phil Marshall, the late Phil Marshall, who, according to the Calaveras County, uh, California Sheriff, is said to have on sometime around the evening of January 31st. Uh, Another Flight 93 that landed at an airbase, at a NASA base. Uh, we know a whole bunch of weirdness went on, and the official story of 9-11 is fake. And we know there was all sorts of weird stuff on the bottoms of two of the planes. They didn't fit uh, as passenger liners. So we're trying to cobble together exactly what happened, and it ties back to the CIA-run base. We just sent reporters there. Wayne Madsen is our guest, and we're just doing a data dump here live on air before the special report comes out last week because it's dangerous to sit on information like we're sitting on. I have interviewed two guests that Wayne Madsen helped me get on that ended up dying. One of them, of course, the D.C. madam. And I mean months after she was on. I have interviewed people involved in 9-11 like Barry Jennings, and he's dead two weeks after he's on, deputy head of emergency management, detailing bombs in Building 7. I'm not trying to get killed. I've got a duty to fight these people. Our country's been hijacked by criminals. Our government, as you know, on the one-year anniversary of Obama saying there's a red line in Syria, if Assad uses chemical weapons, we will invade you. On the one-year anniversary of that, when they had the U.S. forces ready to invade in the air bombardment, Al-Qaeda launched two different chemical attacks. It later even came out at the U.N. and mainstream news that, indeed, Al-Qaeda launched the attacks. Because Al-Qaeda isn't completely controlled by the West, it's a wind-up toy and they shot videos to be rock stars. That's what they do. College, you know, people want to get touchdowns to get girls. Al-Qaeda chops Christians' heads off, rapes women, and blows up churches and launches chemical attacks. 
And, of course, it came out. It was Saudi Arabian uh, nerve gas. It was identified. Now they flooded Europe with all these jihadis. We don't know exactly what happened on 9-11, but we know that it's not the official story we've been told and we've seen. So, Wayne, I want you to get into what you, from your research, really believe happened on 9-11, but also, as you said, the data dump on this. But I interrupted you with the break coming up when you were making the point that this is a drop plane. Well, we know in Operation Northwoods, they talk about having two aircraft, one that they fly up, that they blow up, the other that they actually take off with CIA personnel on board with John Doe, Jane Doe names to have those people's names in the news. The FBI, to its credit, as you know, came out two years of 9-11 and said, we went and looked at these so-called calls. None of them were real. The, um, the solicitor general's wife did not call him, as he said, on CNN. Uh, 